All right, we're about a minute past, so I'll kick us off here. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dana. I lead Blue Cat's corporate communications program here, and we are so excited to have you um, for the first in a series of critical conversations about critical infrastructure. Um, as you know, you've joined the Network VIP community. Uh, we, we intend for both these conversations as well as the, the community in Slack to really be a place for, for pros like you and IT to, uh, to be able to connect over things that matter at work, maybe some of the fun stuff in life too, but um, specifically we created this community um, in the open forum that it's in um, to ensure that everyone who, who's seeking expertise or advice or best practices when it comes to DDI or networking can find it regularly, no matter sort of whose technology you're using, whose customer you are. Um, and so here we are, uh, this conversation we're about to have, um, it's not meant to be about, you know, Blue Cat's product or services. Uh, we're really here to, to encourage some, some good thinking around what's probably quite important right now. Um, I've got a couple of housekeeping notes, but um, so I'll start actually probably with, because we're using Zoom, I recommend that you use the speaker view uh, to enjoy this conversation as best as possible. That said, the best way to chat with people, both the um, sort of interact with the panel as well as interact with your fellow guests is to go to the general channel in the network VIP Slack our uh, community steward, Christian, will be posting some polls in there, seeding some discussion along with Truman. We will do a Q&A at about a quarter two, so keep an eye out for that. You'll be able to actually come on live if you want to and ask a question. That's the beauty of um, this format versus anything else. And, and we'd be remiss, I think, if we started this discussion without a hat tip to some of our, our most engaged community members in Network VIP so far. Now, for, for those of you who are new to the group, um, we award these things called karma points, which are basically a way or our way of celebrating awesome feats of community. I know that being a member um, of a group actually does take a lot of time and energy and, and just mental effort to put yourself out there. And so uh, anytime you ask a question or post a poll or answer a question and help out um, a peer, you get karma points. And currently, the top five leaders, Christian keeps a leaderboard. He's the most organized person I know here. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to Bob Harold, Herman Poon, um, John Macy, and you're on our panel. Uh, Killian, who I think believe said wasn't able to be here today, but hat tip to him and Zachary Belly, who I see is on the call. So thanks guys for spending your time with all of us. Um, without further ado, um, I'll introduce you to your host for the day and moderator, as well as reiterate a little bit about um, our theme today. And so again, today's conversation is going to be all about automation and helping you discern what's um, realistic when it comes to thinking about efforts at your own organizations within your own practice, um, especially amidst all of the, and I don't want to throw the word hype around too much, but there, there has been a built up reputation for automation that I think we can all agree exists. So uh, to do that, we've brought together people I consider friends in the industry. And so thank you to all our panelists for being here. We're going to introduce you in a minute. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that honor to Andrew, who's going to be our host today. Um, Andrew is the Chief Strategy Officer at Blue Cat. He is the host of the Network Disrupted podcast. Uh, he bakes bread on his off hours. Andrew, take it away. Huh. That's a good introduction. Thank you, Dana. Uh, so great. So let's get started just by having everybody introduce themselves. Why don't we start with uh, Phoebe Go from NetApp. Okay. Hello. So I'm Phoebe Go. I'm a principal architect at NetApp. Um, yes, we are a storage and data management company, um, not networking, but automation is pretty big for us too. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, I don't know if we're going to talk about this on the panel, but the first thing I automated was something in Bash. And I remember learning Python after Bash and I was like, wow, <laughs> this is much easier than it should be. Um, and yeah, I guess in my spare time, I, I like to make YouTube videos. I work on a uh, podcast, which, which I do with NetApp, which is called Go Your Way. Um, I like to spam people on LinkedIn with videos of me on the weekend. And I like cats a lot. 
All right. And uh, Mr. Macy. Well, wow. hello. Uh, I'm John Macy. I work for Cerner Corporation out of Kansas City. Um, and you're in my spaceship slash home office today. Um, I've been with Cerner for about 15 years. I'm a director and uh, I think my title now is principal engineer, whatever that value you get out of a title is. Uh, but I've been automating for most of my career in some form or another going all the way back to batch files. So, uh, I mean, uh, most of the panel I think probably <laughs> had some experience Hello? in that area. So. Super, I think we all have. Uh, and uh, John Capobianco. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, John Capobianco, I'm uh, again, by title, Senior IT Integrator and Planner for the Canadian House of Commons. And- uh, Yes, hold on. Sorry, is that okay? Everyone can hear me? Yeah, keep going. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so I've been uh, in IT. I started 20 years ago as a student in a three-year computer programmer analyst course. But by chance, my placement was in the um, services, the help desk uh, at a Ontario Ministry of Health. And so I spent the last 20 years doing more tr classic traditional client server ne enterprise networks. Um, and about, you know, three or four years ago, automation uh, kind of came on to my radar. And uh, I've more or less transitioned into more of a developer now than a network engineer. So I'm hoping I can contribute to the discussion uh, and uh, maybe help people in that current position of maybe a network space. How do you get to a developer? So I'm, I'm glad to be here. And Phoebe, I consider my NetApp, that's as part of my network. That's my SAN. So you're very much welcome to the network side of things. I consider my storage is just an extension of, of the network fabric. So I, I'm, I'm excited to have you here as well. Thanks, John. And Ethan. Hi, Ethan Banks. I'm the co-host of the Packet Pushers podcast, or one of several that are in our uh, podcasting network. I'm a former CCIE and uh, worked for a number of large enterprises over the years doing automation back when Perl was a thing. I guess no one really uses Perl too much anymore, but um, these days I'm trying to just keep up with the rapid pace of change with uh, the network automation world. And it does seem like we're converging around uh, some Python and some Ansible and a few other bits of tooling, which I've been ramping up and uh, trying to get my head around. So looking forward to this conversation today. Thanks for having me guys. Yeah, thanks, Ethan. Ethan. Yeah, I, I, and I think that that really is where it all comes from in this rapid need for change and rapid need for change, not just in the tooling we use, but rapid need for change in the network and infrastructure in general, so we can meet the business's requirements to continue to make changes uh, well beyond what anybody could have done manually. But from my perspective, doing anything from manually is anything manually is painful regardless. So, uh, so why don't we just get started with with a definition? Um, so, so John Macy, the broad definition of, of automation versus orchestration. Why don't you take a stab at that? Sure. Um, the, it, it, there's a lot of overlap in, the, in, the, in that terminology space. And depending on who you talk to, you, you're going to get some different answers. But the way I view it, the way we typically viewed it, um, is that orchestration is at a higher level and more... Uh, I'll call it business process oriented. Um, it's, it's the act of, of stitching together or bringing together, right, other acts of automation, where automation is more task oriented um, and uh, less, uh, you know, I might do 50 tasks to, and have to orchestrate those through different flows or activities, but the tasks are what you automate. Um, and typically it's automation is about the removal of required human interaction on very specific commands or, or, or functions uh, is what most people kind of define as automation. It, it, once again, we're talking generalities here yeah, of course. across the board. Uh, somebody can argue about that stuff yeah, they're, literally they're for hours. Right, I know, and, and it's really almost a useless argument, but, but I, I think that's right. And uh, I mean, orchestration basically, um, you know, automating automation <laughs> to some extent. So you get into this, 
circular definition as well. Well, orchestra orchestras are based on the same word. And if you think about it in terms of that, right, automation has to do more with the individual instruments and the music that they're playing. And orchestration is the guy standing up at the front directing all of those to get the singular sound that you want out of the event. Yeah, for sure. So where does this start? Um, I don't know, maybe Ethan, Phoebe, you know, where, where, do, where, where do you hear when you talk to people in, in your network, whether they're people you work with or uh, just in your network in general in, in this, you know, um, where do I start? What, what do I do to begin automating? How do I learn this stuff? What, what, is, what do my skills mean today and how does that relate to automation? Well, I think there's a mix of things here. Um, you can't, eventually you want to be automating your network as a system, but you don't start there. That's too big of a thing. So find the thing that you do over and over and over again that takes a lot of time out of your day and figure out how to automate that thing. That, that is a place to start, you know, one, one small bite. Yeah, I, I think it also starts with actually understanding what you do before you even try and automate anything and it's it's kind of going what are the tasks that i that i need to do and it might not actually even be your network it might be something that you're doing in a spreadsheet or something that you're doing by handwriting it and then just thinking kind of changing that mindset into a okay how would i make this a repeatable process and then how would i then put in the steps to then programmatically call that from another system so i think that's the absolute basic starting point. Um, but talking to a lot of customers, you know, just in, and then trying to get into that journey, it's, it starts with, okay, what are the things we're doing all the time? I think, like Ethan said. Yeah. And isn't there also a perspective of, you know, am I automating things I'm doing all the time to make my life easier? Or am I providing automation so other people can do what normally I had to do, whether I was automating or doing manually, uh, I now have another customer who's going to utilize this automation. Yeah, I, I definitely think that is a really good way of looking at it. Who's going to get the value out of it? So I think that that there's a lot of fear that automation, you know, the bots are taking over the world. But I think really what it is is saying, well, let's free up that time from doing that task that somebody keeps asking me to do over and over again. Um, like in a storage space, it's normally, oh, can you extend that volume? Can you provision me a new volume? It's those kinds of mundane activities that if you could automate that and let them kind of call the automation themselves, you're freeing up a lot of both your cycles. Right. And I think that's where the complexity starts coming into the journey, because if, if you're automating it, then maybe you can lay out some arguments or some sort of control file that makes sense to you, because you know the current state of the different SAN clusters or, you know, for that specific business unit or for that application or for those requirements from a, I don't know, data residency standpoint, data needs to be over there versus somebody who might need to utilize that who might not know all those specific parameters. Uh, actually, that's a really good point because I know this is a network a group and one of the things that you know a storage administrator probably doesn't know is you know, what are the, the layer two, layer three network subnets that you, and, and routes that I need to care about. So they're just going to give you, you know, here's a, here's a whole class C and then, and then realize, oh, actually things can't talk to each other because all I did was automate the actual provisioning of a volume and present it to a, to a network segment. I didn't realize that there was actually some other logic in there that I needed to think about. <laughs> so that's where it starts to get complex. Yeah, I think it really does. Really, uh, I don't know, uh, John, maybe you've got a good example of where you started. Maybe one of the first things you automated. Sure, I, I wish I had this discussion access to this panel uh, three years ago when I started. I hear Ethan and Phoebe's comments and I, I wish I had have started with a small bite and have an understanding of what I was doing I, I, because I was ignorant. And that's, you know, I don't, I don't mean that disparagingly, but I'm talking about myself so I can use the word. But I didn't know what I was doing. I, I found docs.ansible.com. I found a module that could do what I wanted, but I was using Notepad and, and a file transfer program into a Linux environment that was new to me, right? I had 20 years of, of CCNA, CCNP, CCNP data center, the OSI stack, routing, all that stuff. And I was, I was doing it that way. I wasn't using developer tools or... Um, and we can get to that later. I'm moving a little quick. But my first, my first true automation playbook that I ran to explain to you, you know, maybe where I missed the mark so someone could learn from this mistake 
was a very complex, complicated change at my core and my distribution layer across 50 routers plus eight, up to eight virtual routers or VRFs per physical router, right? So that's why I started to do the automation. I thought, look, I, I can't give operations 500 change files to go switch by switch and do this manually. That's, that's not the right approach. So let's try this to, as our first automation exercise. Um, 500 routers and let's make the big change, right? Um, How, how'd that work out? Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, it, oddly enough, I found success, right? But my colleagues, this was day and night of toiling over. My weekends were gone. My lunch hours were gone. Any spare minute I had went into my little Frankenstein I was building. And uh, it worked. And I, I took away a lot, right? Like, it was actually almost a boon to myself to, to succeed the way I did because I learned some bad habits and I, you know, I, I but generally speaking, I, it was successful. I didn't take down the network. Um, so, you know, it's funny. I can laugh at myself now looking back at that, that, that approach. And I, and I would not suggest that approach to anyone. I agree with the small wins, the small bites. And, and what I like is the, the ability to gather information which we can all agree is a safe exercise, right? That's where I would point someone to, to say, look, you let's start with just going and running a playbook against a single device and get, you know, interface status or the routing table or some stateful information back, get it into a text file and then start to build from there, right? Yep, automation is a journey and there's a, you have to set the expectations of maturity with, within that journey construct and if you start off trying to build a Maserati and it's the first car that you've ever built the chances are that you're going to be dissatisfied or you're going to have other other challenge points right right and so that agile approach of let's let's give the customer a, a bicycle while we're working on the end state car right mm -hmm. uh, a little more modular or and agile let's build a go-kart yeah, yeah. Right? right, and the the likelihood of you killing yourself in a go kart is a lot less than you killing yourself in a, we'll call it an incorrectly built, uh, sports car that can go two hundred miles an hour theoretically. So, it's really you, you want to build it, and as you're doing that, the things about uh, that you mentioned around developer and and you know developing things and using the tooling and things. That comes with that, right? You're able to step as into that as opposed to necessarily falling into the lake and drowning. Right. Uh, if it, you can start with Notepad, that's perfectly fine to start with Notepad um, and start building skills and learning. You, sh you should be aware it's iterative, right? Uh, <laughs> I have rewritten <laughs> literally hundreds or thousands of lines of code at times because I got down to the end of it and the light bulbs started going off about, well, you know, dumbass, why did you do this methodology? Right. Why didn't you do this other thing which would have made it more agile or I could, I could make change? And that's probably I, and my final comment in that space is, Build everything that you do with the idea that you're going to need to change it in the future and take a couple of extra steps or take a couple of extra amounts of time, right, to, to build in those, those things that are going to support you in making changes. Because if you make a very brittle, very uh, rigid uh, construct, you're going to be dissatisfied with it when a change comes in and you can't service that change. Yeah, and John, right. I mean, that's that, and that's where you know, as you, as you go through this journey, that's where it gets to. We're writing software, and and the advice you just gave is is the same advice I'd give somebody who is learning to write software. I mean, it, it's, you know, and, and and for all intents and purposes, that's what we're doing. And and uh, but John, when when you were talking about this massive place you started, as opposed to a, uh, you know, simple go pull a router. Um, the, the thing that occurred to me was, how did you test that? And, and I think that's also, you know, coming from what, what John Macy was just saying, something that, that's always going through my mind, which is, you know, if I can't test something, I don't want to write code to do it. So, right. and, and we've had, 
uh, a, a, we, we've had a customer um, write automation and test automation in production that led to some not necessarily good outcome. Um, right. and, and in that case, they were just testing, you know? And so right. um, I, I think that approach, I'm sort of curious how, how you were thinking about that to begin with, but if you're going to change something, you know, what I want to know certainly as a developer is, is it going to work? How can I test it? How can right. I assert that it, the change was correct? And, and, you know, how do I, how do I continue to test it as I change it? Because this is another tenet of software development in general. I mean, if I can't test it, it it's almost impossible to change it. Right. So I think to give myself a little credit, one thing I did right was map what I would have done in a human space, right? As opposed to, you know, this magical button that I developed, um, which I can talk about later, it's not the right approach, but I tried to build the magic button that someone could just press and go do the changes. But I, I thought about those things. And in a human space, I would say, okay, before you do this change, go get the OSPF neighbors, the routing tables, these stateful artifacts about the state of the network pre-change, you know, make your change and then regather, collect those things um, post change and do the differentials are all my do I have a hundred OSPF neighbors between my core and all of my buildings as an example pre and post right um, am I able to send certain pings from certain areas of the network to other areas of the network so I think I have a little bit more of an advantage over say a software developer that has to know if an end user is clicking the buttons the right way and using their GUI the right way I have a network state that I can test against and automation I mean it's not even a comparison, right? It's, 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 it's a robot versus a human to test at scale. Um, you know, one, asking my human operator to log into all, you know, 100 virtual routers after the change and go get those, go get the show commands and start doing your differentials as a human versus being able to programmatically do that. I mean, my change went from a full weekend outage to a 45 second, fully validated, fully automated, um, fully change controlled execution of a play, which is to, to John's earlier point, the orchestration we put around the automation. Um, so we use the network state as our kind of bellwether, whether or not it was a success or a failure. Yeah, no, and, 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 you know, good. I mean, and by the way, it relates to software development in general as well, but, but yeah, you, you, you're going, you're going to make a change you better understand the current state. And when you wrote that automation between then and now, that state might have changed. So, right. you know, you, right. your, your logic might not be appropriate anymore. And The only thing uh, that I would add to the discussion is that, you know, I had, this was a great success within my organization and it set off a lot of thinking in a lot of different areas. But what I was lucky and fortunate that, that a developer, the, the director of development, software development, actually approached me, which was odd because I work in the technical infrastructure space and said, look, we, it sounds like you're doing some great stuff. You need to get into a Git repository. You know, you need to hook up with some of our developers. They'll show you the ropes, get this stuff under version and source control. No more working underscore version three underscore new dot test files, right? Let's move this into true version control. And, and that opened the door to VS Code, which opened the door to extensions, which opened the door to YAML and Jinja and, and right? It's, it snowballs. It, it, so anyone and intimidated by the field, it snowballs very quickly. Doors open other doors, which open other doors. And, and soon enough, three months later, you, you're, you're doing things entirely different with an entirely different toolkit. Right, so where, so, so you were lucky there, you know, you, you had somebody from the software group come and talk to you about best practices like change control and those sorts of things. I don't know, may, maybe get a sense from some other people on the panel. Um, what, where were you at the beginning of your journey, especially as it relates to um, writing automation for infrastructure and network versus writing software and in, in, in the tools and best practices around that? I don't know, like John, did you... What what did the beginning of your journey look like, Mr. Macy? Yeah, let's just call me Macy. That All right, way. we'll do. Yep. We'll just <laughs> not be confused uh, in that space. Well, I, so I, I'm a big proponent of version control because the first time that I need to go find somebody who happens to have a version of a copy of a script that they modified for something that I need to do, and I can't find it, that's a problem. 
number one, at, especially at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, number two, uh, it sets us up for the ability to actually do things like reviews of, of the activity. So I may write something and not take into account certain variables that I just don't, I don't have an understanding of or know of. And having somebody else be able to review that um, and uh, provide commentary back, maybe even contribute back to it, but they have to have a platform in order to do that. You can't do that in email effectively. You can't use a file system alone for this. You need that kind of tooling. And before anybody gets overly intimidated, using a tool like uh, version control, there's three or four different ones out there. I started off with subversion. Um, it, it was pretty easy to learn. Um, and you don't have to go through the rigorous developer uh, process necessarily when you're starting off. All you're looking to do is keep track of your changes and to make sure that you're always working on the current stuff or you can flip back to a previous version when you go off on some wild tangent that breaks something in a significant way, you can, you can always go back. Uh, when you're dealing with Notepad, a lot of times that's not really realistic to have that expectation. So um, use that. Um, I'm a from a, in a, an editor, a tooling standpoint. I like VS Code for a lot of the things that I do. They've taken that tool and really blown it up uh, in terms of capabilities and interactions. So uh, I mean, just. Macy, using on something your, uh, that on your, does your the editor, form. you said you're using VS Code. Your version control is integrated in there, I'm assuming, right? It is directly integrated in there. I don't even have to, I mean, for the, for the level of version control that I'm doing for a lot of my work, I don't have to drop to a command line. I don't have to learn, you know, a, chain, you know, a, a, re, a repo language, if you will. Uh, it's point and shoot. And you can get as complicated in terms of workflows within the repos as you want to. Uh, so for example, we graduated into doing an approval process. So we don't release our scripting until it's been reviewed by at least two uh, designated engineers uh, to, to review it. We have automated testing available to us. I, I'll be the first one to admit that a lot of our testing still occurs in a lab environment where we, we control, to Andrew's point, state so that we can verify that the code that we're executing with um, exactly how it affects state. Um, now, there's still some risk that we, we assume when we do that because in a production environment, your state is constantly changing. So you have to take that into account, but it, it, it's, it's the path that you go on to get there. I didn't start off that way. Um, in fact, I, I mean, probably in the last three years, I started writing code to do my tests. Right. And, and I'm going to say that from a software development standpoint, that's pretty late to the, yes, late to the game. Uh, that's been going on for, many years prior to that, but I didn't start off that way. Um, I think that's normal. That's normal, John. I mean, I, yeah, I think uh, yeah, but I, I want to make sure that our, our, our guests here in, in this uh, event understand that you don't have to have all of those answers up front, right? You, you need to recognize that they're there and they're out on the horizon and that you're working towards getting to that point. And, and you can't let, what tool you pick or decide that you like, uh, what file format that you want to use, all of that stuff shouldn't get in the way of the actual objective of becoming more efficient, more accurate, um, and literally profitable, right? Yeah, yeah. I have uh, to echo that. And, uh, I, you know, I've memorized my nine Git commands. The, no, the, don't mistake me for saying I'm a Git developer. I know my nine Git commands, and if I get into trouble, I blow away the folder, and I clone the repo again, and I start over. So you don't, I mean, I still do that today. I, I did that an hour ago. I blew away a folder and get cloned to start again. 
So don't be intimidated. There's the, you know, and, so and to the so point stash, of stash stash yeah. isn't one of the commands that you're. <laughs> it's in, not right? on my list yet. No. I, I've written down git stash. Uh, you know, right. I, I have git lost is one as you know. That's about as as far as I go. I think the other thing about version control that I I found really useful with automating was um, collaborating with somebody else. So there's the review piece, but there's also uh, the fact that when I started automating, it was to make my life easier. And then we were talking a little bit about how it's making somebody else's life easier. And then it was realizing, well, other people want to get in on this. And if I don't put it somewhere that they can get to it, I'm emailing, you know, PowerShell files and text files and script. And it's just, it's this horrible Nightmare. mess. And Outlook doesn't even let you do that anyway. So yeah, so it was, it was like, well, here's a central place where we can all go and whatever's there is going to you know, be the latest, then we can work on things incrementally. Um, I was creating. I, I think there, there's some hesitancy with um, with people as they start to show people what they're doing or to share because it, it could betray, you know, that they're naive or they're not quite sure what they're doing. And and if they're traditionally an expert in whatever they're doing every day, then it it might not be you know, something they want to broadcast. And th th there's no reason they necessarily should feel that way. Obviously, we, we all hope we have colleagues that aren't going to giggle at our work. Um, I'm assuming some of mine have giggled at my work. But outside of that, um, does, you know, how do you encourage people to share? Oh, this is so, I was so excited when you said that. Because, yeah, I, I mean, in my history, it's been, you get this box from the vendor and the vent, and then you go in there and configure it. You, you make it perfect. And then you put it in the data center, you go press, turn it on, all the lights come on and it's, it's done. And there's no intermediate steps. And I know, you know, setting up load balances and so it can be very similar in a lot of ways. So I, I love this because as more things move towards software and we move towards these platforms where it's, it's, you can make incremental changes, you can roll back or you can make an incremental change. You go, mm, it's kind of different and I want to keep modifying it. It just becomes so, so useful to go, well, this is what I got up to and it got this far. Can you help? You know, maybe, maybe you can, you've got better ideas of how I could do it and you can show them those incremental steps. And I'm so excited about that because I think it makes us all better you know, technical citizens, because you have to, you, you can't just go, oh, it's just kind of magic, it works. You, you kind of have to understand what it does. And so you can explain it to somebody else, you can automate it as well. So you get, you, you do become a smarter person, but you may not have that, you know, I have the magic wand and it just works. No, for sure. You, you have to be supportive, right? And open uh, when you're doing it. It's no different than our, anybody else doing writing or, you know, almost any other thing, you, you have to be willing to have somebody tell you that this is a better idea or yeah. you didn't think of this or whatever and understand and be open to the fact that that's a good thing. Um, and that together you will always create a better product. And I want to emphasize that the, Andrew, you, you alluded to the software development piece. When you create automation, you're creating a product. You may not necessarily have the business support looking at you from that standpoint, but in the reality, you're creating a product. And the more input that you have when you're creating a product, for the most part, the better the product will be at the end. Absolutely. Yeah, no, totally agreed. Uh, and, um, and, and often, I think when when we review uh, other people's work, we learn as well. And it, we might learn that um, uh, we're not providing enough information. We might learn that there's not a, a common understanding of what the goals or the requirements of the product are. Um, I mean, it, it it colors a lot of the way that that uh, that more senior people might collaborate with others as well. I think it, it's a it's a critical part of the process. The best way to learn is collaborating with those that that you know have done this before or have gained some maturity in the process as well. Um, back to your VS Code. I mean, I thought, you know, we're, we're taking a lot of people who are moving from the command line to, to writing some software. I've assumed it would be uh, command line and VI. But that said, you know, in terms of integrated uh, uh, change management and, and, you know, checking in and out of code repositories or whatever through, through some sort of IDE, um, the, the sort of downside of that is not really understanding how these tools work because everything's just behind a magic menu. You know, I find at least personally when I'm jumping into something to begin with, 
it's easier to get closer to it than you know work with an abstraction layer until I really understand how it's working and then then I can you know go through the abstraction layer. So I, sorry, I temper that I temper that a little bit, Andrew. Right? If if you have the objective of automating something and you are a, just presumably a network engineer, right? As your as your background, you don't want the tooling that you're using to overtake your right. your objective, and learning curves, right? Uh, for uh, if you start off in the software development scheme, and 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 go through that trend, um, you've got a lot to learn before you can even get started. And I, it would be my premise, right, that uh, once again, you walk your way into that. You don't necessarily run at a sprint uh, to use a, a term that I'm sure will uh, spark you. Right. Uh, but it, I didn't, uh, I used a GUI based for version control for most of everything that I use for it, right? I don't drop to the command line unless I absolutely have to. Uh, for version control specifically, but I will tell you, I'm not of, I use VI, I use Nano, I, I use all sorts of things. But when I'm developing something that's automation, it's a product, it's code uh, for, for that, I like VS Code at this point in time uh, from a tooling standpoint because it's got all of my stuff uh, available to me. I, YAML formats, JSON formats. Right. Uh, Python. Yeah. I, and, and, and I and, rules from F5, right? Right. I've right. got a module for I rules in VS code. So I have all of the syntax at my fingertips. Uh, and it, it just shortens my development time significantly. Totally, totally hear you. And, and by the way, if, if you have the ability to run some sort of testing in that ID as well, even better. Um, so Ethan, what do you hear from the, the broader packet pushers community around uh, nervousness around getting started or how do I get started? And you might be on mute or ignoring my question. No, it wouldn't unmute. I pressed the space bar like Zoom's supposed to and it didn't work. <laughs> Sorry. So I just manually unmuted myself. So Andrew, what I hear is just folks who are very intimidated about getting started. That is, you don't, there's so much to take on. And a lot of these, con this conversation hasn't been so bad, but a lot of the network con uh, automation conversations go like from zero to a thousand miles an hour very quickly. Right. Yeah, we're doing unit tests with CI CD pipelines. And everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't even know. I'm intimidated by getting GitHub right now. I'm very scared. Hold me. And they, so they just like, screw it. I'll just keep doing what I'm used to because I understand that process. I can make that work. And so getting your head around that, that whole how to get started thing, what the right tools are to spend time on, because there's, a, is it a, is a zillion a legitimate thing? I don't think it is, but there's like a zillion tools to choose from. Right. Uh, and, and picking those things that you can use and not wasting your time on things that aren't going to be valuable to or intimidating for people as well. So that whole baseline, there's no... With network automation, there's no place to start in the industry like a lot of us had 20 odd years ago when we were budding Cisco engineers, let's say. Cisco provided a training hierarchy where we could start in at that, well, they haven't even, they have CCENT now, but I mean, then it was CCNA is where you started, then you moved into CCNP, and if you wanted to go crazy, you went and did CCIE stuff. You could follow that ladder to get a... Uh, uh, a foundational training that you would build upon over time. And with network automation, it's like, woohoo, guns slinging and you got your cowboy hat on, figure it out, let's go. Because there's no one standard approach, which again, really intimidates folks who are trying to get a handle on something, not only that's going to be useful to them immediately, but then something that they can build their career upon going forward. They want to get it right. And time is precious. There's not a lot of time to invest in the wrong thing. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and, and certainly leading to, to career development as well, which we'll get into in a second. Um, yeah, I, I think this is an area where, where Google can actually be um, a detriment because, you know, you, you, you end up with a lot of people making decisions based on what they found first or, you know, copying something out of Stack Exchange or preferring some tool just based on how easy it was to find an answer. Somebody who did something similar 
um, and you're not necessarily learning and developing in that process. And it become overwhelming, the number of potential ways to solve the same problem. Um, On the flip side, yeah. I do want to say, though, that I have this problem with, uh, with over-analysis over -analysis and paralysis where I go, oh, look, there's 70 different ways of doing this. Right. I'm going to go and learn every single one of them. And I don't actually end up with the, you know, the, the result because I was so excited playing with the tooling. So I think it's, you know, you've got to keep rem reminding yourself to keep the keep it simple and be flexible to Macy's point, right? That it's going to change. You're going to use a different tool next week or next right. month or next year and be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think enterprises are, are standardizing on, on some tools. I mean, obviously we've mentioned Ansible a few times. I, I was, I was telling a few of you earlier, you know, when I visit customers these days, it's not, well, you know, these days meaning pre March, uh, it, it wasn't uncommon for like, you know, to see 12 Ansible stickers on the 12 laptops in the rooms. It's just, it's uh, a lot of people are, are branding their laptops with this tool and, uh, and gaining a, a bunch of success from it. So I would imagine there's, there's um, Ansible experience among the panelists and, uh, and, and probably that's, that's one place where, where you'd have people or suggest people look to start. I would, uh, that's my tool of choice, um, you know, tongue in cheek, Ansible's, you know, the sky's part, and the sun shines, and I found my Lord and Savior, and I'm, I'm all in on Ansible, because I, it's my answer to almost every question. The, the compute <laughs> people have come along and go, you know, you've automated the network, how can we help? And I said, well, you got to just go ahead and install Ansible, right? It can do your VMware, your Windows, your Linux, whatever you want. Storage comes along, same answer. Cloud comes along, same answer. So I'm fortunate. I feel lucky that I that I bet on that horse three years ago, and that was the tool that I found such a low barrier for entry and success. There's no agents. My security people are happy. It runs SSH. Um, I can encrypt my secrets. So it checked all these boxes for me, and right. I was able to rapidly go right. Um, but yeah, but, John, but, but, so but, I would but just it say, might not be it might not be the end goal. This yeah. this might be a flash in the pan. This might be a three year tool where Nornir or Python comes along when I have more experience in in coding, and I'll just take that power over myself and write my own Python at that almost C level, right? I like go further than a framework provided to me by right. a vendor and do it myself entirely, right? I'm yeah, not there and, and yet. I, Right. And I think th th that's, that's the thing, right? I mean, I mean, Ansible, we always have to be cautious about taking a tool that we prefer and using it as a hammer. And now this is the right tool for everything when it's not necessarily the right tool for everything. And, and there's a lot of innovation in this space outside of that. For sure, for, from, a, from a career standpoint, obviously Ansible is, is, is widely used and, uh, and it's widely used because it's capable uh, for what it's good at. Um, but, uh, but just, um, you know, I, it's more than it, again, it's more than just knowing your Ansible playbooks, right? It's part, it's one tree in a larger forest of, um, it's, it's, it's right down to file types, right? Like network engineers, they see a JSON file and they, and they, they, they react like it's with a rash, right? They don't know how to understand the basic file types that we're working with. So I think it's more than, yes, Ansible is fantastic. And I, and I encourage people to to look into it, of course, but you have to put it in it in its place. It's it's one piece of a jigsaw puzzle, right? A and, lot of people, by the way, get rashes from JSON. <laughs> um, well, occurrence. I think I think the it, to your point, right? The longevity of of your activity that you're going to do, you, you really need to take that into account. Um, and it's better to have the understanding of what the framework provides you and why it provides that for you than it is to necessarily, uh, sir, sure, at, at this point in time, you can make a career out of being an Ansible uh, subject matter expert. No doubt about it. There's jobs that you, you can go do and, and everything else. But um, think in terms of longevity of a career piece, right? You'd rather be, I'm gonna call it an automation engineer than right. you would an Ansible right. engineer, in my opinion, because right. in, if you look at these, if you look at all of the different tooling that comes along and has come along in the past, and you can go back in the software development world, you can do it anywhere, right? There's a lot of times there's a lifespan for those tools. 
And when the, that lifespan is up, uh, you don't want to be left with just that. Uh, yeah, John, so if, it's, the, it's the lifespan, but it's also these tools change and they change frequently. And those changes are often breaking changes or, uh, and, and all of a sudden you're, you're maintaining a lot of code that's been written before that doesn't necessarily work the same way anymore. Uh, there's the, the, the tools themselves evolve in ways that aren't necessarily um, uh, helpful, quite frankly, um, you know, and, and, and you see major breaks in the tools. And, and, and so, so regardless, I, I think what, what Macy said is, is dead on, which is, you know, a, a, a tool is a tool. And from an accessibility of getting started standpoint, uh, there's a lot to offer on the Ansible side. But you should understand uh, the process of automating broader than the tool sets you use. Well, and if you go a step further, it's really um, the thing that revolutionized the world 20 years ago, the API, you know, Web 2.0. Like Ansible's a step to get to an API, right? Let, let's not forget that, right? And it's the API infrastructure, what vendors are doing with their APIs and the availability, right? If you can write the curl in Python, I would say that's, to John's point, an automation engineer. I'm not stuck on just the Ansible tool. If I know what an API is and infrastructure is code, um, you know, APIs are being pushed down to switch level access, switch level infrastructure now, right? So the API revolution that changed software I think is going to change infrastructure um, as a broad statement. Um, and we're going to have this infrastructure 2.0 craze in the form of network automation and, and, and infrastructure automation. Yeah, I, I do totally agree with that. Like the, the, what I'm seeing is like a, this prevalence of APIs where you can go in and like just see what the API does. Um, so you, you, you have some NetApp storage and it's one, th one of the things I really like is you go in there and you play with Swagger, which is a visual way to look at the API and go, what does this do? Or if I change this, you know, I can go and change the variable with, without needing to know what JSON is and make it simple. Just, just make sure it's not Swagger pointed to your production storage. Right. Right, right. <laughs> but I mean, would you agree that, uh, say, Postman is the new putty? I mean, the CLI is dead, right? I, I think everyone is going to have to know how to use Postman and, and hop on an API and do your get and post and puts and well, all for that sure. and, and crud swag, operations, right? Swagger is an amazing way to do that. With Postman, you, you're, you're great. You can package up the API and call it. Uh, Swagger sort of live documentation. So now I can literally fiddle with things and oh and, cool okay you know, so it's, it's a it's, it's more exploratory yeah so yeah. when we look at new vendors and or new product releases the first question i ask is what's the api and everything that they're trying to show me in a gui or, or some sort of web ui interface i ask do you build that using the api and if the answer is no they, they've just fallen down several notches because what that tells me is, is that there's probably activities that I have to have a human go and do to yeah. be successful with the product. And I really, I want APIs. Now, I may not start off using those APIs, but I don't want the super secret GUI click box that somebody has to go check in an automated workflow process, right? That... That goes against everything. Yeah, for sure. But John, right. John, that's that's for you, the API writer, because you're utilizing those APIs. I, I think a critical part of this, and I also want to open this up to, to questions from those who have joined, but a critical part of thinking about the long term of automation is is then abstracting that for the eventual user. You know, us, you know, anybody who's an expert in infrastructure, um, you know, you, your your job is to allow people who aren't experts to be able to provision storage or provision networks or deploy an application that requires networks or anything else. And so um, from, a, from a corporate strategic standpoint, I, I'm always talking to customers about um, ensuring that the vendor API doesn't leak out a couple of degrees away from those that manage that infrastructure because now you're, you're gonna write pretty brittle code, but you're also expecting, um, you're expecting your internal customers to understand how to do things with that vendor, with that subject matter, as opposed to uh, what they want to do, which is just, you know, a simple business level API that allows them to, I need a new IP address. 
you know, it ends up, we have a rule that we don't sign new IP addresses unless there's 20 available, just as a stupid example. So do you want the user to code looking for a network with 20 IP addresses available or just give them an IP address in a network that has more than 20 available? And, and that sort of next level up, I think, is something that we all need to think about. How do I take, when I used to get a manual, like a ServiceNow ticket and go into a system and do something manually, what decisions did I have to think through before I actually did that? What, what did I have to translate from that ticket into, into you know, parameters or things I clicked or special boxes, whatever those are, those need to be sort of built into the API so I, the end user doesn't need to understand those things. Dana or Aaron, are there, are there questions that we can take from the group? I do have a couple of questions that have kind of come in and I've synthesized through the network VIP Slack, but I'd also like to open it up to if anybody would like to remove right. themselves first. Um, I'll ask my question last. I think it's a good way to cap off. All right, so Zachary, who wasn't able to stay till the very end with us, but he asked, and, and I think this is quite poignant, um, like Andrew, you've got a very strong software development background. Um, a lot of you have been doing automation for years now. Um, Zachary asks, and Ethan, you probably hear this a lot, Phoebe, you probably hear this a lot. Um, there's this feeling of I'm in over my head and of overwhelm when you're just looking at it uh, from the get-go. And you kind of touched on this in, in the discussion a little bit earlier. Um, there's also, we asked a question in the, in the channel about, you know, what is it that keeps you from, uh, from getting into it? And David said that part of it is the developer culture. And so my question to you is on behalf of Zachary, of course, how do you start? What, what is the immediate thing that you can do if you feel overwhelmed? How do you get over it? I, there's been a whole implication here that network engineers need to become coders and developers. That, that seems to be the, the timber of this conversation. I don't know that I agree with that. So I'm hearing people get overwhelmed and I'm not sure they need to. I think maybe you need to pick someone on the team that's going to be devoted to developing automation tooling for your team. And not everybody necessarily is going to do that. So that's part of it. Um, you know, we're talking about digging into swagger documentation and looking at APIs and, you know, and all the rest. And yeah, if you're engineering minded, you can do that and begin to take it in. But is that what a network engineer role is ultimately going to be or transitioning into an infrastructure as code developer? And I'm not convinced that that's the way necessarily for everybody there. I think there is room just to use tools like, uh, uh, John, you were mentioning Ansible, you know, today, but maybe that's a three-year tool and you go and look at something else. I don't know. Maybe Ansible's got longer legs than that because it handles like, like item potency. Well, if I want to code item potency, that's a lot of logic and a lot of work to do to be able to get there. And Ansible does that for me. So I think maybe there is room for those, uh, that kind of tooling. And that uh, is a long way to say, if you have a tool that can do a lot of the work for you, it's, you're less likely to be so overwhelmed. Maybe pick a tool that gets a lot done for you. Yeah, I, I just to pick up where Ethan left off, um, you've already written code. You might not know it, but you, if you've been in, if you're new to the field, maybe not, right? If it's day one, but if it's day one, you should be looking at learning the OSI stack and layer two, layer three, not learning how to automate things that you don't understand. But if you've been in the year in the in the industry for two, three, five, 20, 15 years, you've likely written code of some kind. You might not call it code, right? I, I've configured an interface on an iOS router. That's code that, that the router has to interpret and you've done it. So so just have some confidence in yourself. If you figured out I'm a CCNP. Ansible, you will figure it out, <laughs> right? It's anything, it's not even close to the difficulty of the concepts of routing protocols and BGP and OSPF and all this stuff you may already understand. You will pick up this stuff quite easily. Um, one thing that maybe we missed in the discussion is what the goal is. And John Macy touched on it earlier in an earlier discussion. It's the elimination of snowflakes. It's to boil things down to templatable objects where you can cookie cutter a thousand routers using item potency to Ethan's, I love the word, and, and applying it to infrastructure. Can you, today's practices that you use, could you make a thousand routers exactly the same except for the host name and management IP address? 
right? Can you, could you do that manually? I, I would say no, but with a tool like Ansible or whatever, some automation framework, let's say, you can achieve those goals. And yeah. uh, from a starting off, oh, sorry, Phoebe. No, you go. Okay, so from a starting off standpoint, that, uh, and, and specific, to, we'll, we'll keep it specific to network, but you can apply this to storage with NetApp, right? Is when you take a, the, the thing out of the box and stick it in the rack, there's always a set of things that you have to do with it to prepare it to be used, right? That is a perfect automation exercise to cut your teeth on, right. literally. Um, it, it's also very safe for the most part, right? I mean, it, I, I don't know how everybody does everything, but I can tell you that a brand new box that's not actually doing anything for anybody is the place that I would like to learn how to set the host name, set the management IP on it. Uh, what do you got to have to do that? And then configure all of your switch port defaults or your router defaults. Um, you, can, you can do that. And I didn't touch on it too much today in this talk, but governance, standards, and configuration yeah. management are all end games, right? When you talk about automation, because as long as you have a large, a large lot of uh, snowflakes running around out there, right? And snow drifts and everything else, automate, creating automation to handle that will fall on its, own, on its face based on the weight that it creates yeah. with that. So what you want to do is you want to use governance, use standards, use configuration management. And these are all things that are journey items, right? You build them as you go. You do not click your fingers and, and start doing them. Uh, so it's huge because if you do automation without that, it will fall on its face. Thank you, John, for that. Um, Phoebe, I remember you wanted to come pipe in as well. And we've got one more question, I think, to close this out. So Phoebe, go for it for a sec. I'll be, I'll be quick. And I think I, I really like the idea, just make a list of the things that you do. I, I'm a list person, so I'm going to list the things. And then it comes down to, I mean, automation, coding is really, I like to say it's a series of if statements. Okay, if this event happens, what do I want the system to do? And, and, and building that logic into it, because normally if, it, if you're a human and something breaks, you go, oh, I'm just going to fix it. Like, I'm just going to do the change. Oh, the host name is too long. I'm going to cut down one character or whatever. But if it's automated, the computer is just going to go, oh, I can't solve that problem. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's going to cut that character. Maybe it's just not going to name it anything. Maybe it's going to make up a name. So you need to think of those kind of weird edge cases because that's what creates snowflakes in a manual world. And then that's what you're trying to avoid. So I think you come over them over time as you, you build your list out and you work through it, you automate that, and then you run it against a different system and it goes, oh, that broke. Okay, so I need to now cater for that use, that particular use case that I've just gone and you know, broken in. Uh, yeah, definitely don't test that on prod. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, Sal, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, hey, thanks for doing this, guys. Uh, it's great. And I had the pleasure of having lunch with Andrew a few years ago. I was a big uh, fan, but <laughs> unfortunately, went in another direction. I published some stuff in the, uh, in the channel. I tried to go down this road myself and uh, with Joel King from WWT, Dave, who invented Ansible. I couldn't get far. And I think there's a whole new generation of, of tools that are really low code. And what I've done with uh, these guys from Glueware, um, I'm looking at right now, I do, I'm doing a demo right now, a client intentional, uh, orchestrate AI, Cloudify. So I think there's a whole new set of tools because I found it was very, very hard to consume. And I just uh, did a, a demo yesterday with a client. So I will certainly publish some more data for you guys, but I just want to let you know, I, I've started down this path. This is a great conversation. I did not get very far. Um, I'm very far right now because we used to be the land of snowflakes here at Merck. Um, but thanks for doing this. I just had those comments. I published a, a few public speaking events that I've done in the channel and yes, I, i'm very fun. happy to be here and uh this is great stuff guys i look forward to uh, the next one and um i will let you guys know um how it goes on my end but we certainly come a long long way with no python no yaml no ansible no playbooks nothing and it's really amazing 
That is what we've been awesome able to, do. to hear. Yeah, it's cool stuff. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, I really think that the only takeaway from this conversation is that we need to keep having this conversation. Um, there's a lot more that we didn't cover and that kind of came out at the, you know, the last kind of 10 minutes, which is, you know, and this and this, and I wish I got to say this. And I, I'm sure that you all have some questions as well. I know I'm so curious about what Phoebe sees among her clients, other conversations Ethan has, what John sees day to day, what both John see day to day, actually. Um, and so I invite you uh, to, to keep this conversation going in Slack general, um, either you know, privately message people or ask the question in an open forum. I, I think all of our panelists here would be delighted to continue or to, to um, elaborate on some of the stuff that they've covered today. Andrew, do you have any last words? I know we're about a minute over, but thank you all so much for spending your time oh, with us you, on a Tuesday I've, afternoon. Yeah, I think you said it well, Dana. We, we got to probably a quarter if we want to get through and it's a conversation <laughs> that can go on and on and on and it should go on and on and uh, and and Sal you owe me a lunch. You I got I it. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in New Jersey, I'm, I'm All here. Right. My lab is open. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Um, for those of you who are dropping off, see ya. And for, for our panelists, Ethan, John, John, Phoebe, Andrew, thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. It's been great. Thanks. It was lots of fun. Yep. Thanks Cheers, a lot everyone. for having me.